Friends, my name's Aaron Ciotti. Everybody calls me Ciotti. I just crashed into a bush. Welcome to Sunday Q and A, uh, and we're gonna be getting the 250, which you were just watching from like a year and a half ago. Um, back up in the air. I got uh, after Wednesday night stream. I don't know. I was in the. I was in the. I was in the mood <laughs> to build, not. Get your mind out of the gutter. Uh, yeah, I just kept uh, I just kept working on it until it was done. But I didn't do any of the beta flight setup. Uh, I think I put power to it to make sure that it wouldn't explode. Um, but yeah, so this is uh, this is the 250 with uh, four inch arms, and um, I've got it on. So it, this is a very simple, uh, not simple, very similar uh, setup to what you were seeing in that video. Uh, other than uh, these are now the Aerolite 2004s. I forget which 2004s were on it there, um, but they were a lower KV. These Aerolite 2004s are 3,500 KV, uh, which Tommy had made for me, us, whatever, um, that are on 4S. And yeah, it should rip pretty good. Uh, the video was coming out of the Runcam Hybrid, which is in here, and then uh, McConnell Studios actually uh, made some really nice... 
uh, GoPro mount, uh, uh, Insta360 Go mounts for this little guy. And uh, yeah, you can, it'll carry around an Insta360 Go too without any problem. It's kind of one of the cool, one of the cool things about three and a half inch rigs, four inch rigs, is that they have enough power to carry an onboard run cam hybrid, uh, which gives you pretty damn good HD, uh, but they also give you enough ass to also carry, if you want even better video quality, an Insta360 Go. I think you should pick and, you know, build a rig around the camera and, and not carry two sources of HD. That's just a waste, right? Um, but it is kind of cool to be able to have it set up like this where you can bash the shit out of it um, because the, the HD camera is all inboard, protected by carbon. Um, or if for some reason, you know, you want to get more cinematic footage. Hell, this could even pick up a, uh, a Session 5 or a DJI Action 2. Um, you would just need to throw the mount on it. So that's pretty cool. That's, uh, I, I, I've, I've been looking for things that 3.5 inch and 4 inch rigs do uniquely, uh, do really well with, right? Because 3 inch is, in theory and in my opinion, the right propeller size to carry around a 0 to, like, 25 30 gram payload um so then it's like where is three and a half inch where's four inch you know what are they here to do um they're not quite big enough to carry around a session at 80 something grams dji action 2 though at what 56 grams i think it is uh maybe might be a little bit more than that um that's uh that's a good payload for a four inch rig um the problem is, why wouldn't you just build a 5-inch rig? Because they do kind of fly better. But they're louder, they're heavier, they're more intimidating, they're more, you know, baby-killing. <laughs> so, uh, yeah. There you go. So we're going to work on this. Uh, in the chat, Apache Smoke would never was, sniper was first. He says, good evening, friend. What's up, Collective? Finished building the Glide and Cinesplor. My god, they fly so good. Thanks for getting me down that road, mate. You're certainly welcome, Apache. Um, yeah, my, uh, the, I love helping you guys build stuff because I've spent a lot of time and effort uh, figuring out the, the right combination of stuff. And when uh, somebody is willing to put aside their... Uh, unbelievable want to try all the different things to find the super secret combo and they go with you know the combo that I've spent hundreds of hours and thousands and thousands of dollars refining um, they don't have to go through that process for themselves right and uh, you know if, if you have if you fly anything like me or whatever just want a good flying rig my setups are, are gonna do pretty well with that Dead Chicken FPV was next. John Goblin, Jackalope, Quad Bod, uh, Quad Bod DSR, Quad Bod De Senior, Bulldog FPV, Imp FPV, TS13 FPV, Frank Nicholas, Danzel, the Terrible Athix, Expander, Flush, Doc Cock, CH3 FPV, Robert Garcia, and Bulldog again, Athix again, Flatiron, Super Deluxe is in the house. What's up, Super? How are you, brother? Uh, Denzel the Terrible again, Doc Cock again. Uh, J-Rod FPV reading the wind. Why am I four years old? Mac 282, Super Deluxe, J-Rod, Dan 636, Morton Upshot. What's up, everybody? I'm going to leave it there. If you want the gangly man to say your name, you got to come in early. You got to say something in the chat. Or you can just type CID FPV into your comment, and then I'll know that you're talking to me. You don't have to put an at in front of it, but you certainly can if you'd like. I read all the comments that have me tagged or uh, folks that want to support the madness that is trying to do FPV for a full-time job um, that do Super Chats. Or even better than Super Chats, you head on over to CIDFPV.com. There's a PayPal button. Uh, PayPal does not take 30 plus percent like Google and YouTube do. Uh, and then in the chat, just type CIDFPV, check your PayPal. Uh, also over on my website, there is a Patreon that helps me out a ton. And there's a shitload of benefits, including giveaways every other Monday. Um, Fiverr Store, Teespring, Etsy, is it Etsy? I don't know. Bunch of shit going on, and there's a bunch of affiliate links. Um, treat yourself to something nice, an FPV t-shirt, a sticker, some hardware for your next build, and I'll keep making this cool content. 
here on YouTube for you to watch for free. Uh, patrons get a YouTube playlist with like 92 now, I think. Uh, super secret edits, sketchy stuff that I don't want public, um, Patreon only live streams that I've done, uh, half done edits, half assed edits, raw flying, all kinds of good stuff. I just recently put 16 minutes of raw flying up uh, for the patrons. Um, uh, that's sort of like the, the the cutting room floor stuff from the next edit that uh, FinFPV recently finished up. So yeah, lots of cool stuff. Uh, that 16 minutes is actually some of my best flying because it's some of the more, most recent flying. Um, it was back when I was flying freestyle still somewhat regularly. Um, it was my birthday last year, actually, so a little over a year ago. And uh, yeah, there's some good stuff in there. I'm, I'm nowhere near as good as I was back then at this point because I just haven't kind of kept up with flying freestyle. Um, but that's okay. I've flown an awful lot of freestyle over the years. Uh, if I'm honest, it's it, it it's not. I really enjoy cinematic flying, and I actually enjoy it more um, than flying flying free flying free flying free, free, flying freestyle. Um, freestyle is still fun. Don't get me wrong, but uh, the cinematic stuff is really it's fresh. You know, it's I, I'm I'm sure that eventually it'll get a little bit old, like freestyle flying has for me. Um, but it's new, it's fresh, it's, it's, you know, there's stress involved, there's stakes, um, there's a lot of things about it that I, that I really enjoy. Um, but all that being said, I, I've, I've flown freestyle more in the last week uh, since Mike from GemFan has been here uh, than I have probably in the last year or so since, since uh, <laughs> yeah, since all the hell broke loose last year around this time. Um, and it's been fun. I, I, it's, it's frustrating, um, in a lot of ways, but it's, it's definitely fun. And, uh, I, I want to get out more and do it cause it's, it's really good practice too. Uh, so impact PV tagged me and said a wonderful Saturday evening to Seattle FPV and the Seattle crew. Uh, Denzel the terrible says, what's up collective spending Sunday afternoon with gangling, gang, 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 gangly man to the moon. Seattle FPV. Uh, J Rod says, "What's up, Siati and Collective? Reading the wind is in the house." Uh, he says, "What's up, Collective? What's up, Siati? What's going on, Reed?" Uh, uh, I actually need to add Reed uh, to the to the top patrons section. Uh, everybody, go check out Reading the Wind's uh, YouTube channel. He is a he is now an ultra supporter, um, which is super 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 cool of him. Ram Dago says, uh, "Sat in a pile of drone and laptop puds equals pig and mud." Uh, Wam FPV says. Uh, <laughs> built a loda. Uh, Avix FPV says if you get two sets of 21 millimeter FPV cycle motors, put a set on the 250. Uh, probably not. I'm I'm getting either three or f maybe even four sets of them when they come in. Um, both Cinesplorers, Tooth Fairy two. Um, I'm gonna be really honest with you guys. I have a funny feeling that this 250 is going to get sold. Uh, and I, I love these motor Like, it just makes sense for these. Even if it doesn't get sold, I'm going to stick with these Aerolite motors. Um, it just, you know, I, I, this is not a rig that I'm going to slam and thrash and, and just bang on. Um, and... That's part of the reason why I have a feeling it's gonna get sold. Uh, so, you know, which is fine. That's okay. There's, uh, I have a lot of quads. Um, it's fun to build stuff, test it, see how it is, see how it crashes. Um, I know you guys are interested in this frame, so it's good for me to provide feedback to you guys. Here we go again. Watching a man have an allergy attack live on stream. Uh, but yeah, I, I have a funny feeling that um, that this is either going to get sold or given away. Probably sold. Uh, I think I'm done with the whole giving away entire quads things thing. It's it's um, it just whenever I do it, like when I look back on it, the 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 extra couple of um, it, it it doesn't it, it ends up costing me more money than uh, than what I make from the the extra patrons basically and subs that I get so 
Um, I think moving forward, I'm going to mainly, like, with a full build, I think it's... I, I think what the coolest thing to do is going to be is to put it up on eBay um, and put it up on eBay, like, list it during a live stream, like, halfway through the live stream, and then list it for a week. So on the following week... Um, for the first hour of the live stream, you'll be able to, we'll be able to like watch people bid on it and bounce back and forth. And you know, bidding wars are always fun to watch, right? It's always fun to watch other people spend their money. Um, so yeah, I, I think that that maybe this will be the first rig that I that I do that little cool eBay thing with. Um, now that I'm getting caught up, I'm gonna get back into the three glides that I'm building specifically to sell. Um, so maybe I'll start the eBay thing with this, or maybe I'll start it with them, but yeah, I, I, I have a feeling that's, that's what's gonna, that's what's gonna happen. <laughs> I'm, uh, I'm running on, like, two-ish hours of sleep, so, uh, don't expect, <laughs> don't expect greatness here today. Uh, but laugh at my, uh, laugh at my exhaustion, if you must. Uh, Athic says, no, we got that. Uh, come on, come on, come on. Where we at? Where we at? Where we at? Where we at? Uh, Bulldog FPV says, "Can you show the best three-inch setup?" I'm tired of five-inch and want to go smaller. Uh, no such thing as best, Bulldog. There's just different. Um, I do one-on-one uh, -on -one build planning sessions, is what I call them, uh, for you to plan your your perfect build out, and uh, for me to help you plan your perfect build out. For the first 15 or so minutes of those phone calls, those phone calls are either a half an hour or an hour, um, for the first 15 or so minutes, I just hammer the person with questions. Um, where do you fly? Who's your favorite pilots? Who do you want to fly like? What, um, uh, what are you doing with the footage? Um, how often do you crash? What do you crash into most often? I got a whole big list of questions. All of those questions are what I need to dial in on the perfect build for you. Um, the key emphasis there is for you. Everybody does everything completely different. So everybody crashes at a different frequency. They crash into things, into different things. Uh, here in Atlanta, we slam into uh, metal and concrete mostly. Um, people not in big inner city areas where you can, where there's a million spots to fly. Uh, they tend to crash into trees and grass a lot more. That completely changes uh, the 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 correct or the best build for you. Um, so yeah, the the always always really keep that in mind, right? Like as you're looking around, um, I I'm probably one of the few people that you're gonna find that actually understands this and talks about it. Uh, if you go on Facebook and ask that question. 7,000 people will reply and they'll say, oh, the, the, the best build is definitely, and then they will just list out whatever their build is. Um, the problem with that is that you're not them. You're a totally different person with completely different everything. Um, also, the other big problem with that on Facebook is that most of those people don't know shit about shit. It's their first rig that they've ever bought or built. Maybe it's their second, maybe it's their third. Even if it's, their, if it's their third, they still don't know shit. I didn't know shit until I'd built 50, 60 of these things. It really does take that much to learn the full product line that's available and then to, um, to refine it and figure out the exact right combination of prop to motor to ESC to flight controller to battery to frame um, camera right all these things uh it's an infinitely complex system that we're working with here and it's it's exponentially complex right because there's 30 different escs you can choose from there's 40 different flight controllers you can choose from there's 25 different frames you can choose from there's a hundred different propellers you can do right so it's just there's there's an infinite not really but you know what i mean uh, number of, of combinations and yeah there's only one or two of those combinations that are going to be perfect or best for you uh, so yeah all I can really do is point you towards my channel here if you go to my channel page just click you know CIDFPV down down there um, 
when you go to someone's page, there's a little uh, magnifying glass. You can search just their page. So if you search my page for 250, uh, it'll come up with a whole bunch of videos. Uh, you can search my page for uh, BQE Rip Squeak, R I P S Q U E A K, one word. Um, those are my two of my favorites. Um, but those are two options in a sea of many, many, many others that might be better for you. Uh, so, yeah, lots of good info. And there's also a section down below here in the description uh, with the gear that I use and trust. Um, that's a, a really nice way of just looking at a list of the gear that I've personally used and battered the shit out of and it's held up really well. Um, so if Dur when when you're looking at like my builds, what you want to understand is that my so we everybody has a different priority list, right? Like we were just talking about all these different questions. Um, on my priority list, up at the tippy top of the priority list is durability and flight characteristics. So any of my builds that you're looking at, just keep that in mind. I also have a rotor. Uh, I have a bunch of my builds up on rotor builds. Um, on that website so yeah lots of different ways to look at what i personally fly but understand that what i personally fly might be the worst rig in the world for you right it might be an underpowered too it might be underpowered and too lightweight or whatever um so yeah just understand that every single person has a completely different uh perfect build uh based around all these different things uh really good question though bulldog <clears throat> Brandon Woodford says, what's going on? John Goblin says, do you or anyone really know if setting a motor limit increases flight time the same way lower KV motors of the same size do? Uh, the When you bench test it, uh, motor limiting sacrifices a little bit of efficiency because bench tests occur at 100% throttle. Uh, in the real world, you spend about three seconds total through the course of a battery at full throttle, right? Because you blip full throttle and then you come off of it. So even if you use full throttle 30 times throughout the course of a battery, each time you use full throttle typically is like a quarter of a second, maybe a half a second. Um, so in the real world, um, that particular bench test means pretty much nothing. Um, and for the record, like, if you're only looking at bench test data for 100% throttle, it's completely worthless because, again, you spend very little time at 100% throttle. So stop looking at, at full throttle amounts of thrust. It's, it's just, I mean, I guess it's a little bit important because when you're at full throttle, if, if, if the powertrain is going to make 2,000 grams of thrust versus 5,000 grams of thrust, that's going to be totally different, right? And if 5,000 grams of thrust leaves you with a, a thrust to weight ratio of like 30 to 1, that's going to be a pretty impossible rig to fly. That's way too much. You want to be closer to like 10 to 1 uh, thrust to weight ratio. Um, but yeah, there are people that, that prefer 12 to 1. There's people that prefer 8 to 1. I, I'm closer to the 8 to 1 crowd, 7 to 1 crowd. Uh, the less power that you have, the more throttle resolution that you have. And the more throttle resolution that you have, the easier it is to fly the rig and the more accurately you're going to be able to fly it. And that's what I want. I want my flight footage to look good so that you guys enjoy it. Um, so the least amount of power is one of the ways that you can do that. Um, it's much more fun to fly rigs with 12, 13, 14 to 1 power to weight ratios. But in my opinion, it's excruciating to watch because you are you can't hold your elevation really well because there's so much power in that little throttle throw. So you kind of bounce around with your elevation all the time. And then every time you go full throttle, it just hurdles you into the sky. And we've all hurdled ourselves into the sky 7,000 times by now. Doing that and then just looking down at the ground and waiting and waiting and waiting and waiting and waiting to come down. It, it's just, you know, it, it doesn't... It, yeah, it's fun. It's very fun to do that, but it's not fun to watch that, right? Because it, it's it's fun to do it yourself. It's not fun to see somebody else do it. You know what I mean? So, uh, yeah, there you go. Uh, and, and I've blind tested this. Uh, I ran two different glides for about a year and a half. One of them was on 2400 KV on 6S. The other one was on 1950 6S. Um, completely identical top to bottom rigs. 
and uh, they were motor limited down to have the exact same KV, uh, or the exact same amount of power and everything. And there was never a, a difference in runtime that I could tell in the real world. Uh, and there was never even a difference in flight feel. I, I could not tell the difference between those two rigs in any way. Um, so yeah, in the real world, uh, motor limiting is a free pass and it's really nice. I, I really like, so my, um, my Dead Cat Glide cinema rig is on 2400 kV motors for 6S, motor limited down, um, so that I can put 4 inch propellers on it with guards, god forbid I ever need to fly really fast with prop guards on, um, crank it up to 100% uh, motor limiting to, for that extra RPM for the 4 inch props. Um, that's a little bit less necessary nowadays because uh, we have like five blade and six blade four inch propellers now and you can put like a five blade four inch propeller has roughly the same amount of blade area um, as a, a tri-blade five inch prop so it's much less necessary to do that but if you wanted to do a three blade uh, in ducts, a three blade four inch prop, then you would need more RPM and a three bladed four inch prop is going to be more efficient. So if you had the scenario where you needed a longer runtime with a four inch prop with prop guards on, that's when having those 2400 kV motors um, would be really nice. I, I was initially doing it because I wanted two identical rigs, one of them with 2400s, one of, this is before the dead cut arms went onto it. Um, and it was just sort of like a, you know, when it came time to stop flying that rig freestyle and, and refresh it and get it going for cinematic, I just decided to leave the motors on because of that. Um, and yeah, so there you go. Zanakis FPV is in the house of the wonderful FPV Exchange. If you're not on FPV Exchange, you're just, you know, just missing out. The rest of us are. We're selling our stuff to each other. We're finding stuff that's actually in stock. Isn't that a novel concept? Get your ass over to FPV Exchange or I will beat you with a rubber hose. Uh, Zanakis says, working on the garden fence. CID FPV and peeps. Very cool. I'm going to be doing all kinds of uh, garden fencing, landscaping, house duties soon enough. End of July. Move in with Maggie and the kids. Cannot wait. Denzel the Terrible says, how much for the 250? Uh, I'm probably going to do the eBay thing and just throw it up there with like a $100 starting bid and just let it roll, see what happens. Um, hopefully I don't get burned doing that, but I have a feeling that I won't. I have a feeling that um, there's enough of you guys uh, that maybe might have an interest in a rig that I've, you know, put together in an impeccable way um, and tuned the shit out of. So... Hopefully that has some value and uh, and yeah it, that uh, that could be a now that I'm thinking about it like that could actually be a half decent um, way to make a couple extra dollars here. All right, that's a little bit better. This lights are a little bit hot. Uh... TS13 FPV says, any suggestions on a lightweight HD cam to go with my 3-inch micro apex build using the thumbnail just, uh, uh, and just uh, not satisfied with the quality? Uh, so stepping up, uh, here's, the, here's the hierarchy, TS13. Um, I don't know if the micro apex will clear a run cam hybrid. Um, hopefully it will. It would be incredibly short-sighted of them to not have um, set the front end of that thing up to work with the Runcam Hybrid, but most of these frame companies don't really know shit about micros, so they just kind of shit micro frames out of their asses, and, you know, sometimes they're good more often than not, they're garbage. Uh, so, uh, Runcam Thumb is kind of like the bottom, basically, uh, and then a step up from that, it's a pretty big step up, is the Runcam Hybrid. Uh, which is basically a 13 gram solution, so it's not much heavier than the thumb. The thumb, I think, is what, eight grams, and then you've got a separate FPV cam, which is another like three or four grams. So the the thumb, and, and then you've got the thumb mount, 
the, the mount for the thumb. Um, so it's probably no increase in weight to go from an external thumb and a separate FPV cam to the run cam hybrid. Um, but just for the sake of you know this conversation, the run cam hybrid is basically a 13 gram payload is, is, um, uh, is what you're carrying around in extra weight for that HD camera on there. Um, that's gonna be a big step up in quality. Uh, and then, uh, if, and, and if you want to look at the quality that you can get from the, uh, the run cam hybrid with uh, some light color grading and a little bit of work in Premiere, uh, I have an edit, uh, a drifting edit here on the channel called Four Inch Motion. Uh, you can look it up. That was filmed with a, uh, an FPV cycle four inch prototype rig uh, with a run cam hybrid V1. The V2 has slightly better quality, but it's, it's pretty much the same. Uh, so you can check that out if, if if somebody wants to drop a link to it, that's great. If not, just search the channel for... Uh, it's in my FPV edits uh, playlist. You'll find it pretty easily. It's called 4-inch motion. Um, and then uh, the next step up from there... Well, I guess in between those two uh, would be the Insta360 Go 1. Make sure you buy it off of Amazon. You get the Asurion uh, physical damage protection. <clears throat> That's only a slight step up from the thumb, though. Uh, I would I would definitely go with the run cam hybrid over that uh, if the frame will support it. Next step up, and it's another relatively big step up, uh, is the Insta360 Go 2. I have a feeling that, that that's what you want. If the thumb is not good enough quality, um, the problem with the run cam hybrid is you get props in view <clears throat> uh, on most frames. The AOS 3.5 is probably the only frame where you're not going to have that situation, but... Uh, we're not talking about that frame. Uh, so yeah, Insta360 Go 2 is another big step up. Phenomenal quality. Um, and then you're going to go all the way up to the DJI Action 2. So I think the Insta360 Go 2 is, is what you want. Make sure that your motors are not uh, super notchy, super coggy. Uh, that will cause jello. And yeah, other than that, prosper. <laughs> Get a better HD cam and prosper. Uh, Athic says, look at the live stream channel on Discord. Let's see if Discord will not uh, bomb the live stream. Well, that's opening up. Hold on. I gotta get a, I gotta get something to drink or else my voice is gonna go. Hold on. Stand by. I'm coming back, I swear. I'm still here. Just getting water. Coming back. Almost ready. Here I come. One more second. All right, here we go. All set. All is right with the world. All right, so let's see. Where am I looking? Live stream channel on Discord. Uh, too fitty, breaking at the arm joint. Yeah, so, uh, <clears throat> oh god. This guy's got a, uh, this guy Athix over here has got a, uh, full-size hero on the top of his. Yeah, I would not recommend this unless there's absolutely no chance you're gonna crash, and that's not a thing. Like, there's always a chance you're gonna crash. Uh, the, the too fitty frame has very thin arms. This camera is going to make this frame all up too heavy and the these arms are going to break like crazy um so yeah that that's another so that that's another big um consideration right when i do build planning with folks is like when they tell me that that they want to put a hero eight up in the air um i'm not going to suggest a frame that has skinny arms i'm going to suggest something like that so if it, you know if i was working with athix on that right and he told me he wanted to put this, yeah, that's actually a Hero 10, um, up in the air. Uh, I would have talked him out of the 250 frame and into something like the uh, Impulse RC uh, Micro Apex, actually. The Micro Apex, um, I actually don't like it unless you're carrying a heavy payload. It, it don't, because the arms are too thick, they're four millimeter thick arms. And in a freestyle setting, four millimeter thick arms on a Micro, um, those arms are never gonna break. 
And what that's going to do is that's going to put all the load into the motors. And on micros, the motors are very fragile. We need three millimeter motor shafts. We get two millimeter motor shafts. Um, so uh, the 250 is a great frame for a freestyle setup um, at an all up weight of 250 to 300 grams. Um, but if you put a big heavy camera on it, you're overloading the, the strength of the arms, right? So you're going to break arms constantly. Um, 250s already have an issue breaking arms, but I actually prefer that. It, I will always take a frame that's going to break an arm that costs $3 or $4 and is easy to replace over a frame with infinitely strong arms that's going to break motor after motor after motor after motor after motor, which are a lot more expensive and a lot more of a pain in the ass to change out. Uh, so yeah, it's, it's all sort of a part of it. Um, and yeah, that's why there is no best. There's just different. Um, there's no best build. There's no best frame. There's, there's different for each individual person, depending upon all these things, payload, all up weight, what they're doing with their footage, all that good stuff. Um, uh, Zanakis FPV, dropping link to CIDFPV.com. Thank you, brother. Bulldog says, understand your concept. Much respect. Um, 661 says, is BQE going out of business or what? I emailed Bill a week ago and haven't gotten a response yet. Um, yeah, I Facebook messaged him about a week ago and I haven't heard, of, I haven't heard back yet. Um, sometimes he does take a while to get back to me. Uh, not enough time has gone by where I'm super worried yet, but... I mean, what can I do? I, I don't, I don't have his, uh, I don't have any, I don't have like his cell number or anything like that. I've always just talked to him on Facebook Messenger. So, um, I doubt they're going out of business. Um, Bill's had some family stuff going on, and he's a human being like many of us. So, uh, be as patient as you possibly can. I know that's hard, but uh, yeah, he's a person like us. Um, so, give him as much uh, leeway as you possibly can. I wish I had a better answer for you, though. Uh, Izalku is in the house. He says, did you try iNav for freestyle as a change or even KISS platforms? Uh, I've never tried iNav. Um, I did spend a month or two a couple of years ago um, only flying KISS and Flight 1, um, and I was extremely underwhelmed. Um, the easiest way to think about KISS and Flight 1 is that they are just old school PID controllers, very similar to like Betaflight 3.5.7 and earlier. Um, they, and, and that makes a lot of sense because there haven't really been significant updates to KISS or Flight 1 uh, since like 2019, 2018, 2020. Yes, in the last six months there have been some things that have been added, KISS Ultra and whatnot. But they are still so, so, so far behind. And they have like one or two developers. You know, Betaflight has 50 plus developers. Like, and 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 so you've got 50 plus developers and you've got a huge head start. Like, you know, if if I don't, I don't really have to say anything else, right? Like, you can figure out the situation from just that right there. Um, if you're dying to try something different and you want a better appreciation of Betaflight, absolutely try KISS. Absolutely. The best thing that came out of, out of those two months uh, of me flying KISS in Flight 1 is an incredible appreciation for how unbelievably good Betaflight is and how nice it is to have a huge community of people um, that's working with beta flight and troubleshooting beta flight, trying to get any straight information, actual, f like factual data driven information about kiss or flight one is pretty much impossible. What you get is a whole bunch of people that say like, Oh, well maybe try this. It might work. And then you maybe try that and it might work and it doesn't. And then somebody else says, well, maybe try this and it might work. And like all through that process, you're breaking shit. You're wasting your time. You're wasting your life. So don't waste your life. <laughs> um, and and iNav, I don't think really makes any sense for freestyle. iNav is only it only makes any sense for long range. Um, so yeah, it, it and, and I'm not really interested in long range. So no real reason to to spend time um, trying iNav. I um I I really try to prioritize 
the things that I'm going to spend my time on. Like I, I've I've wasted a lot of time in the past uh, not listening to to smart people that that are very experienced. Um, I, you know, like on one hand, it, I guess it's kind of nice that I have this ex- that I did spend that time with Kiss and Flight One so that I can factually say to you guys like. You know, it's 100% hype, um, and just, you know, the cool kids use it. So if, if if that's what you want, and that's fine, you know, if you want to feel like a cool kid, Kiss is a great way of doing that. Um, but just go into it understanding that it, it's it's light years behind, and it'll never catch up, right? It's just, like, how? How would it ever catch up? Like, this whole bullshit of, like, oh, well, closed source is always better because the people are getting paid. Like, that's nonsense, like, look at open source projects. They are always, all, well, not always, but uh, much, much, much more often than not. Let's say this. Properly supported open source projects by people that are passionate and big groups of people, right? That, and and that's, that's a big part of it, right? Is that closed source, because there's money involved, it's only ever going to have like especially for us right in a very niche hobby it's only ever going to have one or two or three people working on it because that's all that they can afford whereas an open source project like beta flight look how many de- right 50 plus devs because we are a big community but <clears throat> um yeah it's i'm not gonna i'm not gonna beat this dead horse anymore um but yeah, just just kind of keep that in mind. Be be mindful, in my opinion. Be mindful of your time. Um, uh, the whole beta flight versus kiss thing is, you know, it, it's a known quantity. Like it is a known quantity. There is data behind behind it. There is no arguing that beta flight is far superior across the board, other than the cool kid factor. So yeah. And that's fine. Again, if 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 being a cool kid, being a cool kid might literally make you fly better, and it absolutely could make you enjoy yourself more. And that's fine. That's why most of us are doing this. Um, so, you know, that's that's totally fine. I I feel like I come down too hard sometimes on, on uh, on Kiss, but I don't know. I just kind of get tired of people asking. And, and I also get tired of people trying it and then telling me that they regret it and then they wasted a lot of money and time and shit because that was my experience. I, I, I do regret it. I wasted time. I wasted a ton of money. Um, and yeah, so I don't want to see people go through that same thing. And that is the story that I get from most people. Some people that are extra stubborn will stay with Kiss for six months or a year, but they pretty much always end up coming back to beta flight and when they do come back to beta flight they're like holy shit i can't believe how much better this is i can't believe how much more information there is how much yeah so there you go there's my thoughts on it but who the hell am i you know i'm not as successful as steel so don't listen to me uh <laughs> uh where are we at here youtube did the thing Chris uh, Craig Jordan says beta flight sets the default I term up around 98 for pitch roll and y'all is that okay I'm very new at this uh, the stock beta flight settings have been refined uh, by like we were just talking about 50 plus developers uh, and they've been refined for the last six or seven or eight years uh, so they are great the the especially in 4.3 um the 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 defaults are absolutely amazing um if if the rig doesn't fly poorly there's no reason to change anything don't fall into the pitfall of oh my god i have to tune all my rigs um one of the best things that you can do for yourself as a pilot is to not think about or touch tuning leave everything alone and just fly until you're like two or three or even four years in, there is no need for you to touch your PIDs. Or and or if you somehow start booking working paid gigs, then you, you need to have a tune that's good. Um, otherwise, uh, believe it or not, having a rig that's tuned well is going to hurt you as a pilot. 
because it's going to cover up the mistakes that you're making as a pilot. And that's bad. So if your goal is to get better as a pilot, stop tuning. Leave it completely alone. You could make a, make a you could actually make a really strong argument for pulling all the pids down to make the rig fly worse because the the lower the pids, the bigger the 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 more headroom you have in the tune, the more you can pound on your motors, the more you can pound on your propellers, the more you can pound on your entire setup and it'll just keep flying. Um, and it'll also, like I said before, it'll show you when you're putting the rig into dirty air. And the less often you put the rig into dirty air, the better. That's the part that's on you as a pilot. The best pro pilots in the world know how to not put their rigs into situations that cause bad flight behaviors. It's one thing that we are all very good at because most of us are have been flying for so long that we initially, like the filtering and just the, the drivetrains and the parts setups weren't good enough to handle prop wash like they do now. Um, so we had to learn to fly around it. Uh, and that's one of the things that separates really, really, really seasoned pilots from folks that have been in the game for a year or two. Um, so yeah, uh, if at all possible, don't touch tuning uh, unless you have a reason to, unless you have paying gigs um, or unless you're good enough that um, just have a reason for it. Have a reason for tuning. Uh, basically. Athix says, did you get rid of the five inch arms? I think I gave them to Patrick. I gave Patrick the um, the prototype 250 uh, that Tommy had sent me with the five inch arms. Um, and then I bought this one over here with the four inch arms because I couldn't just buy the four inch arms. Um, so yeah, I think Patrick has them. They're the prototype arms though that don't have the dual mounting. So you can only run these Aerolite motors on those prototype five inch arms that I had. Denzo the Terrible says, I'll take it off your hands right now. Um, you're gonna have to wait, Dan. You're gonna have to wait. Cause I, I do wanna fly it again. Uh, there, there, is, um, there is a chance. When it, was, when it was up and it was on the 20 by 20 stack, I really loved the way it flew uh, on the three and a half inch props. So there's actually a chance that now that it's on the Akon AIO um, and with the higher KV motors that I might kind of fall in love with it. I'll probably still sell it because I know that it's it's not going to be super durable and I really want my stuff to be super durable. So I'll probably still sell it, but there's actually a chance that I will hang on to it. So yeah, stay tuned uh, for that. TS13 says, I was thinking Caddx Peanut. Um, I don't know a whole lot about the Caddx Peanut. But the whole, but for me, it's no cheaper than the Insta360 GO 2. And you can buy the Insta360 GO 2 from Best Buy online and get the Geek Squad protection. And quite frankly, that right there is worth about a million dollars. So, uh, yeah, I would recommend not doing the peanut unless you can find it from somewhere with physical damage protection. Even if you can find it somewhere with physical damage protection, it's not going to be as good as the Best Buy physical damage protection. So, I just I can't I can't justify the Cadex Peanut. I know that both of them are very fragile too. Um, so yeah, uh, I I don't I can't find a compelling reason to get the Peanut over the Insta360 Go Two. Um, also, the whole like no battery inside thing it forces you to only use it on the quad. And the Go 2 is a great little action cam. Um, if you want to start doing like vlog kind of stuff, it is really nice for that. They give you a bunch of different mounts. You can put the mounts like all over your car and then just take that thing, throw it in. Hey, I'm going to such and such spot, let's fly. Um, and that, you know, the, the difference in production value and having that versus not is pretty real. Um, it's insane that I don't do it, but uh, I have actually been doing it. I just haven't been editing, so, but that'll change soon. Espander says, Micro Apex has 28 millimeter standoffs in the front, 20 millimeters in the back. That means that it should clear the run cam hybrid. Uh, can't guarantee it because it's close. 28 millimeter standoffs, um, it ends up, uh, it, it's like just the right size. 30 millimeter standoffs, good to go no matter what. 28 millimeter standoffs, it is tight. So it's gonna depend on where they put the mounting holes um, Hopefully there's a set of mounting holes. Uh, like I said, it would be 
if just look up on rotor builds uh, micro apex and see if anybody has a run cam hybrid in there uh, oh perfect mr. huggy says impulse RC actually shows it with a run cam hybrid done there we go uh, Athic says also would you recommend the instead of 360 go v2 absolutely Spander says, uh, sorry, 26 millimeters, not 28. Oh. Uh, well, if they show it with a run cam hybrid, then it fits, right? So, um, although I don't know how they would clear it with 26 mil standoffs. Uh, but if they show it with one in there, it obviously fits, right? So, yeah. Uh... Super Deluxe says uh, he's been testing the bones durability. It's surprisingly durable AF. Um, I've I've seen that. I've seen some of uh, Super Deluxe's um, bones durability testing. I'm shocked by that. I was pretty sure that the bones are going to be fragile as hell. Um, also, keep in mind, somebody told me the other day uh, that they broke their bones and it cost them two hundred dollars to get it replaced from GoPro. I don't. I don't. I mean, why would someone lie about that? On one hand, but on the other hand, I thought the the deductible for their protection plan was a lot less than that. So I don't know if there's like service fees or anything like that. Um, anybody in chat had to do a, a so you can only buy the bones from GoPro, and then they give you the option to do the five dollar a month thing, uh, which gives you two replacements per year. Um, so you're gonna pay sixty plus dollars, sixty ish dollars for that monthly protection thingy. Um, and then the cost of the bones. If you then have to pay two hundred per replacement, that's that's an awful lot. I I, I hope that it's not that much um, because I don't really know if it's worth it at that point. You can buy Hero Sixes on uh, on eBay and strip them down, and they'll be a lot lighter than the bones. Um, but they're probably not going to be as durable. What's interesting with, with Super Deluxe slamming uh, the bones a bunch is that, yeah, I mean, it's pretty obvious that, like, the reason why the bones is heavier is because it's they've figured out a way to make it somewhat durable. Um, so, yeah, kind of interesting. Uh, Impulse uh, with hybrid cameras. So, Mr. Huggy dropped the link. Very cool. Uh, Athix says, uh, that is not my 250. Uh, oh, oh, okay, thanks. Good, 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 good. Yeah, you know better. Uh, I can't, uh, that link doesn't work here on the 13-year-old computer. Uh, Athix says, uh, it was someone who did it that wasn't doing good build planning. That's <laughs> exactly right. Um, although, you know, like that, that, the, that 250 build with the, the Hero 10 on it, um, that's going to be an extremely efficient, and safe way of carrying here a 10 around so as long as they never crash that's a, a fine build but this whole like just don't crash thing is just the stupidest thing ever anybody that says just don't crash that's a person that doesn't fly uh, so always keep that in mind anytime you ever see someone uh, say just don't crash that is legitimately a person that does not fly they're they're one of these armchair FPV people that watch all the stuff on YouTube, do lots of builds, put the builds up on the wall, and that's where they stay. They're not someone that actually goes out and flies 10 batteries at a time uh, a couple of times a week. So don't listen to that person when it comes to anything surrounding like durability or flying or anything like that, right? Um, so those are the, seeing those posts are, are, are important because now you know like, oh, that's a person that I don't want to listen to basically. Um, and you can remember their name so that in the future when they give bad advice, you don't follow it. Uh, 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 Yella Captain is in the house. YouTube just did the thing. Scrolling back up. Uh, late to the party, but you're right on point. I'm with Betaflight since version three, uh, and you just grow with it. And there's so much good sources of information. Yeah, that was the the that that was to be super honest. That the the biggest thing, the biggest mind blowing thing to me. Um, when I came back to beta flight was how nice it is to actually have information that's vetted that's like real actual information not just like yeah I don't know try this I don't know try this like 
it, it's it's just maybe that doesn't frustrate you, but it drives me fucking crazy when there's not actual information when it's just a bunch of people fucking closing their eyes and throwing darts at problems. Like that's I I can't I can't do that. That ain't me. So uh, Ram Donko says, do you have an ELRS receiver and is it easy to change to 868? Um, I have a few ELRS receivers. I have no idea how easy or difficult it is to change it to 868. I'll bet you it's not very hard, uh, but I have no idea because I've never had to do that. Um, but I'll bet you in the software, in the ELRS software, there's just two options, 900 or... Oh, although, wait, that would be... I, I do not have an ELRS receiver that's that's 900 megahertz, though. So, um, I really have no idea. But I bet you it's just a button that you click in the in the thing. Uh, Bulldog FPV says, you're more entertaining than steel, though. <laughs> Thanks, dude. Uh, I wish more people thought that. <laughs> Apex FPV says... Uh, TTFPV was the person with the Bowen's replacement issue. Very cool. Um, am I right that, that didn't didn't TTFPV say it cost it ended up an all all sum total and then ended up costing them two hundred dollars? Is that right? Um, Synthetic OG uh, says Bones with subscription is a hundred dollars to replace. I thought the older GoPros were sixty to eighty. Um, yeah, that's what I thought it was too. I thought it was a hundred bucks for the deductible, uh, but. I think I remember um, there, it being like there was a service charge, there was shipping, there was something else. And then, you know, I think you have to pay the shipping for the broken bones back to them, right? So I think like he basically totaled up everything that he spent um, and it was like 200 bucks. And that's, that's a tough pill to swallow, man, because that's an expensive ass camera up front. But it's looking like it's pretty goddamn durable. So as long as it's somewhat durable, right? Realist, the, the Bones is not a freestyle camera. Like, get that, if that was in your head up until just now, get that shit out of your head. It is not a freestyle camera. Whether or not Super Deluxe, you know, finally manages to break it or not break it, it's just not a freestyle camera. Like, freestyle is getting stuck in trees, getting stuck on roofs, getting stuck in situations where that thing's gonna overheat and it's just gonna take an unreasonable amount of abuse. It is just not a freestyle camera. It is a cinematic specific camera. And in a cinematic setting, the crashes are a lot less violent. They can still be pretty violent. Like if you have a Cinewhoop that fail safes 100 feet above concrete, that's gonna be a hard ass hit. But usually you're not flying Cinewhoops 100 feet above concrete. Usually you're flying them two inches above concrete, right? Um, so in most crashes, a cinematic rig is not gonna slam super hard. And as long as the bones is somewhat durable, which is looking like it is, that's probably totally fine. And that eases the burden of a potential $200 replacement. So I don't know, it's... Um, it's super interesting. I really want one, um, but they're really expensive. And, and I have a Hero 8 um, that still does work. And I have Geek Squad protection on it. So, like, I'm locked into this kind of forever, so to speak, you know, because of that Geek Squad protection. I'll just keep renewing and renewing and renewing. Um, so it's a, it's, a little, it's, it's a little bit of a tough pill to swallow. Uh, but at the same time... It is absolutely insane that I only have this one. Um, so it would make an awful lot of sense to have this and the bones. Uh, so that if I'm on a gig and this stops working, um, I can switch over rather than like, hey guys, I'll be right back. I gotta go to Best Buy. In which case they're gonna send it out anyway. Uh, so I'm kind of fucked. Uh, so yeah, realistically, I, I should be buying a bones right now, but... Uh, I don't know. I'm broke, yo. Uh, Dexter Greenman says, I have a Mamba F411 AIO on my 3-inch. TX1 has Express LRS on it. TX2 has Smart Audio, but I want to add a uh, BB Logger. Do you know if it will work on TX2? Uh, no. You Well, I mean, if you take Smart Audio off TX2, it will. 
uh, but you can't you can't double up. Smart Audio is going to be sending sending info that you that the the logger is not going to want. Well, plus you're going to have to sit. Yeah, it's it's just not going to work at all. So yeah, if you pull Smart Audio, which is not the end of the world, right? How often do you really change your channel? And your VTX probably still has a button on it. So God forbid you don't have Smart Audio, you still have the button. You're going to have to look it up. It's going to be a nightmare. But um, not the end of the world, right? Uh, and you're probably not going to um, use the logger forever, right? The loggers are usually like you install them, you get the tune dialed in, then you pull them off. So yeah, take take Smart Audio off TX2 and put the, the, the logger on there for the time being and then uh, switch them back. John Goblin says uh, Express LRS 868 megahertz and 2.4 uses different software. You need to switch out every receiver uh, and get a, a new module. Correct. Yeah, there is... Um, there is a physical hardware difference uh, between 2.4 and 868 or 900. Um, uh, so yeah, but usually, and I, I can't, um, I can't confirm this, but with Crossfire, for example, uh, 900 and 868, it's just a switch. It's it's just a thing that you click. Um, I assume that ELRS is the same, right? Because those two frequencies are so close by. Um, you should be able to just click a button. But don't quote me on that uh, because I have not looked into uh, 900 megahertz ELRS stuff. Uh, and just like that, we're caught up on chat. Let me move the uh, the chat. Oh, wait, no, we're doing all... Uh, I'm not really doing... Hey! Uh... あきらめんなよ。諦めんなお前。どうしてそこで謝るんだ、そこで。もう少し頑張ってみろよ。ダイナムだね、目開けてみたら。周りのことを思うよ。応援してる人たちのことを思ってるのって。なんかもうちょっ
uh, separates here. So the cap comes off, of course. Uh, but then there's another seam here. So you can technically buy refills for these and then just buy one of these and keep it forever and just keep refilling it. But um, I've not done that. But yeah, man, uh, flux pen, absolute necessity if you want to make your life easier. It's not even so much about like getting better quality work because like you can you can get good quality by just using good quality solder joints by just using the 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 flux that's in the core of your solder um but having a little bit of extra flux on there it, it's just it just makes your life so much easier it really does it, it's it really makes a big deal this is the one that i use that came with fpv crate uh it says yasker on it and it worked totally fine but it ran out really fast um this guy is empty now and it's it's not refillable it doesn't have the same seam here so that i can open it up and refill it um so yeah there you guys go there's mailbag for the day let's get this uh let's get this 250 set up what do you say friends dexter greenman with a 199 pound super chat thank you very much dexter no comment, just supporting the madness that is uh, trying to survive as a full-time FPV donkey. Donkey raping, shit eater! Uh, all right. We've got USB plugged in. Let's fire up Betaflight. I'll actually be kind of interested to see what version of Betaflight this thing ships with. This is the Akon AIO, absolutely brand new. Um, there's a chance that this has Betaflight 4.3 on it. Let's see what it's got. Nope, for, wow. A very recent version of 4.2 though, 4.2.11, very cool. Uh, it is flat on the desk right now, so we're gonna calibrate the accelerometer. Let me pull my hands up so I'm not shaking the desk because my uh, my legs shake all day every day because I was a drummer growing up and uh, I have anxiety issues. All right, so that's good to go. I need to see what UARTs I put stuff on. So let's take a quick look. I've got Smart Audio on T3. So we're gonna come down here to UART3 and we're gonna go to, well, this has a tiny, hey chat, here's a challenge for you. Does the tiny tank use TBS smart audio or Tramp smart audio? Who's got the biggest brain in chat or the quickest Googling skills? Uh, I'm gonna take a guess at TBS smart audio. Uh, so that's on UART three. And then it looks like I've got the crossfire up front I'm pretty sure I put the crossfire on UART 2. I definitely made sure that I put it onto a, uh, an even numbered UART. And it's actually not a crossfire, it's an RXSR. Um, yep, I can see it there. It's on, uh, it's on UART 2. So UART 2, we're going to click the serial RX uh, here. IDV says TBS, Jack Lanois says TBS as well. Cool. Save and reboot. John Goblin says it uses smart audio. Jimmy Carr says tramp. Athix says tramp. Um, uh, a couple of folks saying that 6337 solder is the best. Uh, 6337 solder gives you a little bit more cooling time, which, like, in theory, um, uh, uh, Jabo, uh, you need to switch the beta flame. <laughs> uh, Falco does not have what what you need is anti gravity. In in, in beta flight is called anti gravity. Um, Falco does not have that, and uh, one of the big problems of not having anti gravity is that fixing uh, fixing that problem uh, with the pids. It's like the reason why one of the many reasons that Betaflight is so good is that they have they have figured out a whole bunch of bad behavior, bad flight behaviors that happen either from shitty components or components that are starting to die. 
Um, they have a bunch of things that are targeted at these bad flight behaviors, um, independent of the PIDs. A PID controller can, um, like, the experience of KISS and, and, and Flight One and, and Falco is that it's just a big game of compromises. Everything you do is a compromise because you're trying to fix all of these different issues with just one centralized PID controller. Um, whereas long, a long time ago, Beta Flight realized that that, that it just doesn't work. Like, it, 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 it's, it, it'll, yeah, it's just all compromises. Like, if you want, um, if, if you want it to really fly good, it can't be one big game of compromises. So they they created anti gravity to to handle the problem that Jabo is talking about. Um, they uh, they came up with I term relax to completely crush bounce back, uh, I term related bounce back, uh, feed forward. Uh, there's a couple of others. Um, so yeah, that that is that is that right there. Uh, what Jabo is talking about that was one of the things about Kiss the end flight one that really drove me crazy. Um, because like if you had an absolutely brand new fresh setup and if everything in that setup loved everything else right so basically if you copy Steele's exact setup because he's put the time in to figure out what the mechanical components are that you need to deal with such an OG old ass compromise based PID controller um, then it can fly really good but as soon as you start beating it up it all goes to hell um, and you're you're left with a rig that so you know if you can afford if you have the time and money to just like every single time any part of that system starts to get worn replace it sure kiss can fly okay or if you just never crash or whatever or never fly that's even better um yeah it's um it's rough it's it's really 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 tough to to try to um to try to balance that out. And and I was not able to. Most of the folks that I talk to that fly that stuff, they're not able to. They just deal with it. And they just use the excuse of like, well, it's better than having to learn and actually watch YouTube videos on how to tune beta flight. And like, I don't agree with that at all. There's, there's, it's just so easy to get really good information about beta flight. And, you know, in like five or 10 minutes, you can find a, a Joshua video where he's like, hey, do this, this, and this, and there you go, you're done. Um, the benefit of, you know, the KISS GUI being, like, a little bit easier, I don't even think it is, um, kind of goes out the window. And then, like, you know, the first time something like this, something like what Jabo is dealing with, the first time something like this happens, then it gets really frustrating because you waste a whole bunch of time talking to people that say, like, oh, well, try this, try this, try this. Whereas with Betaflight, it's like, no, don't try this. Like, this is why it's happening. This is the specific thing that 50 plus developers came up with to target that exact problem, and it fixes it every time. Um, so, yeah, it's uh, that was really frustrating. I, 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 I've, I've not experienced frustration uh, um, on the level of dealing with Kiss and Flight One in FPV since I was like absolutely brand new. Um, so I fucking ran from the hills and, and you guys know that I always recommend that you guys do too. Um, because yeah, it's just, you're, you either have to learn to be okay with it and fly around it or you have to switch. Um, and yeah, it's, there's an awful lot to fly around. My favorite, my favorite, 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 favorite. One of the better, arguably the best KISS tuner that there was. Um, oh, shit, what's his name? He was one of the guys in Australia uh, that flew KISS a lot. Um, oh, fuck, I forget his name. Uh, but he came out with a video called How to Fix Bounce Back in KISS. And I was like, oh, my God, really? There's a fix? And I put the video on, and the fix was to, it wasn't Snake, um, it was the other big guy in Australia. Um, and the solution was fly around it. I shit you not. Um, he goes up, and he, and he, he st it wasn't Snake. Um, um, yeah, he goes up, he's throwing the rig around, and I'm like, when is he going to show the, the configurator? Um, and he just keeps throwing the rig around, and he's talking, he's talking, he's talking. And, and I'm like... 
oh, it's and and I just it dawns on me. He's like uh, it's like yeah, he's just explaining how to fly around, bounce back. Uh, Avic says uh, you do say flying a bad tune will make you a better pilot. It's true. It's absolutely true. Um, but uh, you know we're not talking about that here. We're talking about getting rid of getting rid of a bad flight behavior, right? Um, so yeah, that that was when I'll never forget that because I was like, yo, if if he can't tune that shit out, then there's no... T and that makes sense. Like, th there isn't. Like, when you run your eye gains high, because there are benefits to high eye gain, it creates bounce back. It's the way that the PID controller works. It's, it's very specifically the way that it works. Like, our quads are a system that a PID controller works pretty damn good on but not perfect. What what you guys need to realize is that PID controllers weren't created for us. PID controllers have been around forever. They're created for like like mechanical systems. Um, they just happen to work pretty well on our quads, but they weren't created for us. And they're very limited in what they can do. And the Betaflight devs have realized they realized this realized this long ago, and started to develop things that would assist the PID controller for our specific scenario, for our specific rigs. Um, so, furnace technology, Ravel wrote a is that is that where, where it comes from? Furnaces? It makes a lot of sense. Um, Alright, so, back to Betaflight. Good questions, guys, as always. Uh, <clears throat> uh, so, we're good to go in the ports tab, although I feel like the Tiny Tramp is on... Uh, the, the tiny tank is on Immersion RC Tramp, so I'm actually going to move it over, um, even though it, chat seemed to be split 50-50 on, on the actual answer. Um, so I'm leaning towards uh, I'm leaning towards it. I think I remember it being on Tramp. Uh, all right, so this does use a BMI gyro, so that's why we've got the 3.2 as our maximum uh, PID loop frequency. I don't think it has a barometer on it. I don't think it has a magnetometer on it. Even if it did, I wouldn't use them, so we'll kill those. Uh, all right. Uh, maximum arming angle, 180. This way, if you need to, uh, you can arm it upside down. Uh, Jimmy Carr says, I did check its TBS Smart Audio, so it sounds like I need to switch it back again. Uh, that's okay. So maximum arming angle of 180. God forbid you get it stuck somewhere upside down, and the solution to the problem is to arm it this is what you need to set in order to be able to do this. If this is anything less than 180, if this is 179 and the rig is completely upside down, it will not arm. Um, it is safer to have this maximum arm angle at like 40 degrees so that if like you're holding, if you're like holding the quad up against your chest and it's vertical and you accidentally bump the arm switch, it's gonna arm if you have this set at 180. If you have this set at 40, it will not. Basically what it means is that if the if the rig will only arm if it's flat up to 39 40 degrees in any in any one direction um, so putting this maximum arm angle to 180 is a little bit of a safety thing so be careful if you're new maybe don't do that because getting chopped up by one of these rigs is a fucking nightmare you do not want that um, it'll put your ass in the hospital in a hurry uh, Terminal Insanity says, I taped four busted props into a whoop gate. It works well. Tape makes it foldable. Gonna add LEDs to the prop shaft holes. LOL. Taped four busted props into... Oh, cool. Nice. 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 You made whoop gates out of uh, broken props. Very cool. I like that a lot. Uh, telemetry, I'm gonna leave that on because this is an RXSR. LED strip, I do not need to turn that on. I'm not using um, addressable LEDs on this rig. Air mode constant on, I'm going to turn that off because I run it in the modes tab um, on a switch. Uh, OSD is on, dynamic filter is on, that's good. Uh, D-Shot beacon configuration, turn both of these on. And that's about it. Let's save and reboot. Uh, I forgot to check on that first screen if, the, uh, if everything is oriented correctly. So let's take a quick look. Nose... Where did it go? Why did it go back to... That was weird. Nose down, nose up, left side down, right side down. That ain't right. This is the left side of the physical quad lifting up. And in beta flight, it's the nose of the quad lifting up. Uh, so we need to rotate in the configuration 
uh, the gyro alignment. So let's go into here. And I think we just need to yaw it. We either need to yaw it 90 or 270. So we're gonna try 90, save and reboot. And reconnect and come back into setup. All right, nose down. <laughs> nope. Nose down is nose up. So we need 270 degrees, not 90 degrees. Uh, you guys understand what I'm doing here? Anybody getting lost? Right there. 270 yaw degrees. I mounted the flight, the, the AIO 90 degrees different than the way that they sort of want you, you to. Um, but not really. I mean, you, you're going to mount the flight controller however the hell you're going to mount the flight controller, and then you need to pay attention to this. This is important. This will cause a rig to flip out and bite your goddamn face off. Uh, nose down, nose up, left, right, yaw left, yaw right. It's important to check all of those because if you have it like upside down, it can it can act a little bit weird. Um, John Goblin says, little known fact, beacon number four is the loudest. That's interesting. I always thought beacon number one uh, was the loudest. Uh, that's interesting. I usually leave them on one. One is the lowest pitch, so I thought it would like carry the farthest. Uh, but admittedly, I've never put a ton of um, thought into it. Uh, th why am I doing this? This is on 4.2.11. Um, should I put this on 4.3? Um, yeah, Jack Lanois with a really good point. Having a board, having the abort alignment off at all, it can cause your shit to fly away. Yeah, it's scary. Uh, should we put this on 4.3? Yes, we're going to put this on 4.3. So everything we just did was worthless. Uh, happy days are here at last. Auto detect. And it finds Akon F7. Let me hop in here and just confirm. Yeah, Akon F7 is the, is the target. All right, cool. So we're going to update firmware. And Acon F7, release and release candidate, uh, 4.3 RC7. Take a quick look at the notes here. Um, make sure that they fix the gyro stuff. I can't imagine that they didn't. Uh, and this might not even have the same gyro. Fix ICM 2689 uh, initialization. That's it. That's the, uh, that's the gyro fix. Very cool. So we're going to load firmware online. And we're gonna flash firmware, and hopefully we don't have to hold the boot button down. Hey! Most of the new flight controllers and AIOs, you don't have to hold the boot button down anymore, which is excellent. Um, as long as you don't have uh, anything powered, hooked up to, uh, hooked up to um, an odd numbered UART. This Akon uh, AIO is kind of interesting in that, um, I did not find, I hooked up a multimeter uh, to all of the five volt pads when it was plugged into USB and none of them were outputting five volt. That's an interesting way to fix this weird won't go into DFU mode issue. I don't know if that's why they fixed it, but um, yeah, you'll never have that issue with this board because of that. Kind of annoying. It, it is kind of nice to have one or two five volt pads that give five volt when you're plugged into USB so that you can power up your receiver and not have to plug your battery in when you're looking at your receiver in Betaflight. But I think I would actually rather have it set up like this so that you never have that bullshit odd even numbered UART thing with the no going into DF DFU mode. So um, maybe they'll start setting flight controllers up like this from now on because that's a really annoying issue to have to think about when you're building a board. Like, oh, this is a receiver that's powered. I need to get this on an even uh, even UART, not an audit UART. It's also a problem that not many people know about. So, um, Frank Nicholas says BF 4.3, please. Uh, you got it, my man. Cheesehead says, uh, we can't make our EIC sing random songs anymore. You can, uh, yeah, you can. Ha! Mr. Huggy says, Betaflight 4.3, will it brick edition? <laughs> Uh, apply custom defaults and all right now we're gonna redo all that there we go all right cool calibrate accelerometer cool good to go 
ports. Uh, you are two serial. You are four. Was it four or was it three? Uh, it is three. You are three is smart audio, and I'll get it onto the TBS one this time. Save and reboot. Uh, back into configuration we go. Let's get this reset. Barometer, magnetometer off. Uh, put your name in. Arming angle 180. Uh, yaw degrees 270. Oops. Uh, beacon turned on. And we want telemetry. Air mode off. OSD on. And um, yeah, that's it. Uh, in 4.3, the dynamic filtering is controlled in the in the PID tab, not in here. Okay, next up is well, let's. I'm getting annoyed by that warning, so let's come in here. <laughs> We're going to turn on D shot 600. We're going to turn on bidirectional, and these are 14 magnet motors, so we're good there. Save and reboot. Next up is presets here. Let's see. Uh, I'll be interested if there's a um, uh, an RC Link preset for RXSRs. It's probably just like an FR Sky. Yeah, FR Sky S Bus. Okay, so we got FR Sky S Bus, and then I always put this on either ultra cinematic or cinematic. Let's let's go with regular old cinematic. Voltage readings. Choose one. Uh. Is this going to drop stuff into the OSD? That's pretty cool. Uh, I always like single cell values. That's interesting. Yeah, it is. I think this is going to uh, drop stuff into the OSD. That's pretty cool. Uh, Imperial. Imperial dogs. Hardware options. Uh, oh, look at that. Bound with uh, full duplex telemetry. Not the I'm going to leave it alone. Uh, cinematic rates optional. Actual center equals two. Oh, what's that? Is that a rate profile that it can drop in? That's pretty slick. Uh, I'm good to go. Save and reboot. What's up, Rock Crawler? How are you? And all right, we're good to go there. Let's reconnect here. Beta, beta flight seems to need to. Uh, it, it gets hung up when I every time I do those. Seems to for some reason it needs to get uh, restarted. It feels weird doing that, but I think it's working. I don't know. There are things in here. Jitter reduction is up at 14. That's that's a lot. Um, okay, so are we ready for the PID tab? We are ready for the PID tab. So here are the default settings. Uh, these newer uh, release candidates of Betaflight 4.3, my god, these stock PIDs are just dialed. Just really, really, really dialed. I typically I typically push them a little bit, uh, but yeah, I shouldn't need to push them very much on this rig. This is a rig with an onboard. This is pretty similar. So the 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 stock rates mainly like the the ratio uh, between roll and pitch. See how it's pretty close: 45, 47, 80, 84, 40, 46. This is set up, in my opinion, for racing rigs that don't have like a huge discrepancy in weight uh, on the pitch axis versus the roll axis. On a five inch freestyle rig carrying around a, uh, a an HD cam up front, um, you always need more pitch authority. Um, and you can do that right down here with the uh, pitch damping and pitch tracking. The, the pitch damping slider is going to add uh, degain to the pitch axis the pitch tracking is going to add P, I, and feed forward uh, to the pitch axis. So, yeah, if you've got a, a five-inch freestyle rig hauling around an HD camera, you're going to be grabbing both of these pitch sliders and moving them up significantly. Minimum, like, 1.2, um, but I'm actually pushing them to, like, 1.3 or even 1.4 um, to get enough authority on the... Well, no, not not quite that much. Not quite that much. Uh the, is it the damping one that I'm moving up quite a bit? Yeah, the damping 
the the pitch damping to push D gain up, I'm moving that usually up to about 1.4. Uh, but this pitch tracking, uh, you probably only need it at like 1.1 or maybe 1.2, somewhere in there. Uh, this rig that we're working on here is pretty similar to a racing rig, right? The only, so the, the battery is going to be right in the middle. Uh, the, the, so the, what, what we're talking about here is the ratio of weight on the roll axis left to right versus the pitch axis front to rear. A five inch freestyle rig has a huge discrepancy between those two axes, right? Because you've got an 80 gram minimum, 80 gram uh, camera way the hell, this is the center line and that camera is way the hell forward of the center line. So the pitch axis has to move all of the weight of that camera. See how that rotates around? That camera has to move in a totally different circle. And then the battery, to offset the weight of the camera, the battery slides really far back. So the weight of the battery is shifted really far rearwards. rearwards. So the amount of weight on the pitch axis of a five inch freestyle rig is very different than the amount of weight on the roll axis. Um, this rig here, this 250, is not like that. The only discrepancy uh, between those two axes is the weight of the Runcam Hybrid, the carbon fiber cage in the front, and then the, the couple things that are in the rear. A little bit of TPU here, antenna, uh, the Runcam board, uh, and then the receiver and the VTX are down there as well. Um, so this particular rig is much more similar to a race rig than a five inch freestyle setup. So um, here in the tuning, I don't really need to push these too bad, but I am gonna move them a little bit because race rigs are incredibly centralized. Um, and the other thing is, like I was saying before, this rig is set up to also carry an Insta360 GO 2 up front. So if this had that 20, you know, 26 gram HD camera with another five or six gram mount, it is going to, you know, you, we are going to start shifting that balance of weight on the pitch axis versus weight on the roll axis. So just for the sake of, um, of not having to change PIDs, whether or not I, you know, take that camera off or on, I'm just going to move these uh, pitch damping and pitch tracking sliders up a little bit. I'm going to move the pitch tracking to 1.1. I'm going to move the pitch damping to 1.2. Um, those are just numbers that like I find to be uh, in the ballpark. Um, one of the other things that I always do is I always want more D gain. I really like the way that um, uh, I really like the way that extra D gain flies and feels. Um, it smooths everything out. It handles prop wash better. It handles throttle chop bobbles. It, it, it's just it's just a good thing. Uh, so let's come in here. So we've got this slider that moves the D max and the and the uh, and the D gain up and down. So I usually like to have my D max uh, ten full points above the P gain. But the problem with this slider here is that it also moves the regular D gain up and down. So you got to be careful with this slider. You only want to really move it up like a couple of notches. So I'm going to move this one up to 1.1. And just so you guys know, uh, uh, thank you. Uh, just so you guys know, this is like, I'm comfortable doing this tuning because I know this frame. I know these motors. Um, I've heard good things about this AIO. It's stupid to do any of this um, if it's a fresh, if it's a build where you don't know all the components. I might have to undo all of this shit, but usually I can make slight adjustments here um, and and kind of get away with it. Like I said before, though, the defaults in 4.3 in these new release candidates of 4.3 are very aggressive. So this might actually put me over the edge. We'll, we'll see in a minute, but um, I have a feeling that I can get away with this here. Uh, so let's keep going. Uh, tracking P and I gains, the, the defaults are now really good, so I'm going to leave that alone. Uh, feed forward, I run that extremely low. I do not like how jittery uh, feed forward makes my footage look, so I run this all the way down to 0.2. Um, 
if you're not trying to make cinematic footage, you can run this higher and have a much more responsive rig. Uh, but I want my shit to look buttery smooth, so I run this nice and low. Um, Dynamic damping D Max. I give this slider a good uh, a, a good whack because the D Max only really um, uh, becomes active when you're in situations where it needs the extra D gain. The whole point of having the D gain split into the derivative and then the D max is that your your quad can cruise around at the lower derivative value when it doesn't need the D gain and that's gonna have the motors stay cooler. But then when it goes into prop wash, the D gain is gonna increase to a higher value to crush the prop wash. And man, it the the I know Mark Spatz says to turn this off in a, in a lot of cases, but my God, it, it using the D-Max, it really crushes prop wash. Like, I, there's a big difference in my experience running D-Max on versus off, and I really, really, really like uh, the, the performance benefit from using D-Max, uh, and I'm fairly aggressive with it by using this dynamic damping D-Max slider here. So, um, Again, looking at the values right now, my P gain is at on roll is at a 45, and then the D max is only at a 44. I want this D max value to be uh, 10, 10 or so points above the P gain. That's just a number that I kind of realized uh, in tuning in 4.2. It's kind of hard to do it. Like, like look what happens here to the as I move that slider up um, on the pitch. This is one of the reasons why I've stayed away from sliders. I I don't. The sliders just kind of annoy me. I don't want to be tied into this. I, the sliders are a good idea because they keep the ratios, um, but I want to be able to move this up. I want this D max to be 10 points above the P gain. And even with this slider at 1.5, look, 49 to 45. But then look at the pitch, 51 to 68. I, it drives me crazy that it does that, but um, uh, typically you don't need that much extra uh uh, D gain on the roll axis because it's such a lightweight axis. So maybe it's fine. I, I usually end up with this D max slider at about 1.4, and that kind of puts these somewhere in between. Um, I can decrease this a little bit by bringing this pitch damping down. So let's do that real quick. Well, there's almost perfectly 10 points. Um, yeah, let's do that. We'll leave this pitch damping here down at 1.1. That 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 makes that a much better situation there. Uh, all right, cool. Drift wobble eye gains. The the default is really really good. Uh, the tool tip tells the story. Increases uh, higher eye term, improves tracking in spiral turns, orbits, or zero percent throttle commands. Too much eye, particularly with not enough P, may cause wobbles or bounce back after flips or rolls on chopping the throttle to zero. So there you go. That's how you tune your eye gain. Um, generally, you want the drift wobble slider to be as high as it can be uh, to keep the quad tracking in spiral turns, but not so high that you start to see wobbles on chopping the throttle to zero uh, to zero percent. The other thing that too much eye gain can cause is a constant uh, a constant wobble if you have a rig that when you when you zero the sticks and you try to just fly perfectly smooth forward if you have a rig that's kind of shimmying around a little bit try dropping your eye gain down try dropping the slider down um you know if you if it was at one try dropping it down to like 0.8 or 0.7 um and that might help out it's going to have other effects but it, it might help out it depends on everything it it, it depends on um you know the whole system but uh, usually the the regular old uh, eye gains are, are good to go and that's pretty much it the last thing that I do is just kind of look at these values and in my head make sure that I don't think that they're too high um, I am if you know we, we like move all these sliders up and like little by little everything kind of creeps north and that can become too much um, Easiest thing to do is just to grab the master multiplier and just pull it down a little bit. Uh, I'm actually going to do that. I'm going to pull the master master multiplier down to 0.9 um, because, like I said, the the pids are now very very aggressive. Much more the 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 
the current 4.3 PID seems so much more aggressive than 4.2, it's wild. Uh, so I'm having to pull this master multiplier down on a lot of rigs that I didn't have to on 4.2. Um, also, I, I don't know anything about this AIO, so maybe it's going to go ballistic. So I'd rather have this master multiplier down a little bit, and then I can pull it back up if it's all uh, fine and dandy. I term relax here. Cutoff needs to go from 15 to 10. 15 is for racing rigs. 10 is for freestyle. Uh, 5 is for really heavyweight freestyle stuff. Anti-gravity, usually you can move that up to 5. It makes a huge difference. It is a wonderful little thing for killing, uh, killing arm drops. Uh, dynamic damping is a little bit of a question mark right now. Um, I've had a really rough time with 4.3 uh, with my old dynamic damping settings. I used to set it to 50 and 50, and that worked amazing in 4.2. Um, this advance of 50, I have not gotten that to work in 4.3. I've had to move the advance all the way down to zero on most of my builds. Um, and if you roll over the tooltip here, it even specifically says, generally, it is best left at zero. Um, so, yeah, the, the 50 gain still seems to work really well. But uh, this advance, I've been zeroing it out. Uh, I'm going to revisit that and try to start bumping it up, but not, not quite yet. Motor output limit, we're going to bring them down a little bit. 3,500 kV is a lot. Uh, let's go to let's start off at 90% and then we can move it up if uh, if we need more dynamic idle value Let's get that set right now. So here's how you set your dynamic idle Rosser does have a video on this with um, with uh, uh, With some like blanket numbers that you can drop in there I prefer to do it like the old-school way because all the motors are slightly different Here's how you do it. You come into the motors tab. Oh, I wonder if this thing is gonna, I wonder if this is going to um, uh, need a, an ESC update. Hey, this is also the first time I'm gonna plug power into this rig. So let's go to this camera just in case it catches on fire. And I'm gonna use my Vifly V2. This is the only smoke stopper that actually works. If you have any other smoke stopper, throw it, don't throw it away, throw it in your flight bag and then buy one of these for uh, use at your bench. Uh, so we got it, power button on. Hopefully no fireball. No fireball, but it did trip the, uh, it did trip the smoke stopper. Um, it was to a point where it, it, had got, it had given me all the beeps. Uh, so now we're gonna plug in full voltage. Hopefully it doesn't catch on fire. Good to go. So now we're going to uh, spin these motors up. The, the, the amount that you spin the motors up is dependent upon your motor idle. I've been using 5.5 .5 motor idle percent. Uh, it's a good, it's not too low, it's not too high. Understand the risks. Yeah, I do need to update this, uh, uh, the ESC. ESC does not have bidirectional D-shot on it at the moment. So uh, I'm gonna unplug it. I don't think that BL Heli 32 works uh vifly v2 v i f l y they sell them everywhere uh yeah bl heli 32 does not work on this computer all of a sudden it hangs up on this uh checking remote files thing weirdly it works totally fine on my laptop which is what i'm grabbing right now Ooh, chocolate Yo, if you guys see Tony's chocolate at the store, buy yourself some. It's just, it's just incredible. Really, really good. And I'm going to eat some. Oh! Oh, my God. Oh, Tony. Tony, Tony, Tony. You sexy motherfucker, you. Mmm. Oh, boy. That's some good chocolate. They say it's an aphrodisiac. Oh! Alright. You guys don't get to see me for a minute. I needed to get this done real quick. Um, I'm going to update the ESC. Drop, a, uh, drop some questions in the chat, if you'd like.
Uh, Alright, hold on. Firing up BLA32. Not a whole lot to see. Yeah, I'm not going to be able to show you the fucking laptop screen. Uh, I'm just going to update it to 32.9. If, uh, if you have not downloaded a new BL Heli 32 configurator recently, uh, you need to. Uh, 32.8 was problematic. Uh, it's actually really important to, uh, to get the new uh, BL Heli 32. I'm going to, uh, since it's going to be sitting plugged in for a minute, while this updates, I'm going to hook it up to the ViFly, just in case anything weird happens. And I'm going to put the ViFly up on uh, two amp mode so that it doesn't trip like it did on that last one. So there we go. I'm going to connect. Ugh! It's on the wrong port. Oh my god, that chocolate. Mmm. Mmm. I want to fuck that chocolate so bad. Is that loud? Shit. All right, we are connected, and I'm clicking check. Bootloader doesn't seem valid. Oh, it's BLLES. It's BLLES, right, it's not BLLES 32. Uh, well, I have to do that on this laptop anyway, because ESC configurator does not work. What was that? Oh, there we go. Uh, so I'm going to esc-configurator.com, and I'm gonna click, click select serial port. I'm gonna click beta flight. I'm gonna click connect. And I'm gonna click connect again. Uh, serial port already in use, which usually means that beta flight is running. No, beta flight's not running. What the hell's going on here? Uh, preview is running though for no reason. Why? Click and connect again. Port is already used by another application. What? Why are you doing this to me? Don't do this. This is a dangerous game you're playing. Airwave Ant with a three dollar thirty three cent. Uh, wow! Naked HD fun find girl even in the shithole. Now that is a spammer that is really going for it. Uh, hide user on this channel. Stuff like that, let, let me kill those guys because I'm going to hide that on the entire channel. Oh, it was BL Holly 32 that was still running. That was, uh, that was shitting this thing all up. Hmm? Maybe not. Let's, uh, let's pull power. Reset the, uh, ESC. And fire it back up. Alright, let's try again. Click and connect. There we go. Okay, we're good. Uh, and then I'm going to click Read Settings. This BL Heli update was brought to you by Tony's Chocolate. <laughs> Says Dan Silla. Okay, here we go. So, BL Heli has 16.7. We're going to put this on the Blue Jay because we put all the things on Blue Jay. Uh, do not change the ESC. This is C-H-40. Never, never, never change that. Uh, version, I'm going to go 0.16. PWM frequency, we're going to go 48, and flash. And now it's going to take a little bit of time. Uh, Airway Vant says, I don't even have beta flight uh, or tiny whoop, but you can always learn something from this live stream. Hell yeah, Airway. Hell yeah. Man, find girl even in the shithole. Woo! Woo, that's strong. That is... Uh, I mean, what's that even mean? Does it mean like, like while you're pooping, you can find girls? Or does it mean sodomy? Hopefully the former, not the latter. What I fear, the latter. That was quick, that updated really fast. Uh, some of the other things that I do in here, I take the beep strength and I turn that down a little bit. The beep strength is the, the volume of the startup beeps, and I don't, I don't want them to be loud. If I'm plugging a quad in, in the middle of the night, I don't want it to wake up the whole house. Um, so I turn that way down, actually. Um, on 5-inch rigs, I turn it down to like 4 or 3 or 2. Uh, 
on these uh, three inch micro ish rigs, it turns down to about 10. Uh, and then the beacon strength, that is the volume of your ESC beepers. I turn that up quite a bit on micros because they're fairly quiet. Uh, I'm moving it up to 130 here. I'll usually do like 120, 130. Uh, beacon delay, I drop that down to two minutes, which means that if there's, if for two minutes the ESC has not received any signals, it just starts beeping saying, hey, ESC is running and I'm getting hot. Either unplug me or fly me, you fuck. Uh, PWM dithering is on by default. I'm gonna leave it. Brake on stop I turn on uh, just so that when I disarm it, it slams the props uh, stopped as quickly as possible. And then I'm gonna click write settings. And that's gonna write those settings to the, uh, to the ESC. I don't know what the deal is with motor direction, but let's, uh, let's knock that out real quick here. I'm gonna stay plugged into the laptop well, no, we're on 4.3, so we can change motor direction in Betaflight. The sound of our people. Uh, Blue Jay is on there, and it's good to go. So now we're going to go back, and I'm going to show you how to set your uh, all of this to be able to set the dynamic idle. Uh, okay. Although, you know, I also like RPM filtering, so we would have had to do that to get RPM filtering up. So we are plugged back in. Coming back over here, we're going to fire beta flight back up. And all right, so we're going to come into the motors tab. Battery is plugged in. Props are off. I understand the risks. Motor idle is 5.5%. So that means that we're gonna spin these motors up to 1055, 1055 right here. 1055 is the same thing as 5%. And what we're gonna look at is these RPMs, 5100 to 5000 to 5200, 5100, 5000, uh, 4900, 5000, 5100. Get out, ah! And then the last one, 5200, 5300. 5,000. We're just trying to get a range. So the, the rough middle is 5,100 because these things are bouncing between 4,900 and 5,300. So right in the middle is 5,100. Um, now we can pull this master slider down. Um, this is also your opportunity to see how a clean motor feels. So reach over, pick the rig up, spin these motors up and just give yourself an idea of how many vibrations the cleanest you know these motors when they're brand new are going to give you as you start beating these motors up you're going to do this test again and without this baseline you're not going to know what the cleanest they can possibly spin is you want to do this on every single build so these are pretty clean they're not perfect though i'm actually I thought these would be a little bit better than that, but um, they're they're totally fine. Uh, all right, so uh, what was that number? Fifty one hundred. If you need to figure it out again, just ramp the throttle up to ten fifty five again. Uh, fifty one hundred. Okay, so fifty one. So here's how you do the maths. Uh, let's get this battery unplugged. Uh, 5100, you drop the last two zeros, so you just have 51. You take 51, you multiply it by 0.8 to get 80% of it, and you come up with 40.8, let's call it 40. Uh, we come in here, and that is what we're gonna use for our dynamic idle. What did I say, 40? Uh, I think I said 40. Uh, that's how you get your uh, dynamic idle. Uh, that's like the OG way of getting it. If you then want to chase the dragon, this is a very safe number to put in here. Um, if you put this thing up in the air and it doesn't desync, you can start to lower this value. You can lower this value all the way down until it starts to desync uh, when you put it into prop wash, when, when you really uh, rail on the rig. Uh, and then you can just raise it up a little bit more. That's how you get your dynamic idle as low as possible. I've had pretty good luck just using that little thing that I just did, and, and it seems to work incredibly well. Uh, yeah, it's a good way to get it set. Uh, 
thrust linearization, I like to run this down at a value of 10. It gives you a little bit more pit authority at zero throttle. Uh, helps with the throttle chop bobbles and whatnot. Although anti -gra the new anti-gravity in 4.3 really just destroys throttle chop bobbles. It's it's chop bobbles. It's really uh, it's really impressive. Uh, but thrust linearization helps out a little bit as well. Uh, and that's pretty much it. That that is uh, that is what I do in the pin tab. Uh, here are my rates. Actual weight rates for the win. Center sensitivity of 20. Max rotation 700 and then expo of 0.7, which is a lot of expo, uh, but I fly, um, well, no, I mean, I, I yeah, the, the reason why, uh, part of the reason why my flying looks the way it looks is because I use a lot of expo and I use this center stick area to do a lot of work. I don't like when the rig rotates really fast. It, it's really disorient disorientating, disorienting to me. Uh, so I use a lot of Expo, and I think you should too. Uh, I'm going to put Throttle Expo at 0.2, just a little bit. And then the midpoint, usually the cruising point is at about 0.4. Um, uh, but I dial this Throttle Mid in once I've flown the rig around a little bit. We've talked about that a bunch before. Uh, Terminal Insanity says, does air mode still murder whoops in 4.3? I I don't... I've never felt like air mode murders whoops in any of the firmwares, so I guess I'm not the guy to ask uh, that question to. Um, we're going to enable expert mode so that we can run this gyro filter multiplier all the way up. Um, the the gyro low pass filtering doesn't do all that much, and there's a big um, there's a lot of delay associated with it, so. Uh, and then we're even going to turn this gyro low pass one off. This dynamic gyro low pass, I'm going to turn this completely off. So we're going to have just this static thousand hertz. Um, oh well, no, this is a this is a 3.2k pid loop, uh, which is a little different. Um, mm, oh, that's interesting, Terminal. I've I've never had that. That's weird. Um, yeah, it'll definitely glue it to the wall, but I mean, that's, it doesn't happen all that often. Uh, all right, back into this. Uh, I'm going to take this D-term filter multiplier. I'm going to move it up to 1.2. That's usually a good safe value, but it also takes out a bunch of the, uh, delay. Uh, I'm not sure what to do about this. You're supposed to leave one of these gyro low, pa this gyro low pass two on, uh, to handle some harmonic. Uh, but, ooh, John Goblin, good call. There should be a preset for your gyro. Very, very good call. Let's look up, uh, all right, so let's, we're going to save this and then it'll get overwritten. Um, how do you look up which gyro it is? I don't think it comes up in version, does it? Uh, it does not come up in version. What if we type gyro? Joshua put out a video recently. Uh, where you can see what the gyro is, but I forget what the CLI command is. So I just typed get gyro, and that's pulling up every, every, everything with the, um, with gyro in it, but it does not look like it's telling me in here. Um, status, that's what it is. Thanks, NM. So status is the, uh, is the CLI command that will tell you um, all of the interesting stuff. Uh, gyro is detected. Gyro 1, lock DMA, gyro, BMI 270. There we go. Uh, so BMI 270 is what we're going to be looking for in the presets. And the presets are here. So we're going to come up here, and we're going to go to filters. And I actually haven't done this before, so bear with me. What did I just say? BMI 270? Oh my god. Naked HD fun. Take it easy. <laughs> then we're in, it says. Uh, what did I just say? BMI 270? Is that what I said? Well, let's do this. Let's toggle this off. 
Why won't this go away? All right, kill that. And then we're gonna search here for BMI 270. Nothing happens. Uh, okay, what about here? Keywords. Is there a BMI 270 keyword? Hey, look at that. All right, so we got that. Why is it not, nothing's happening. It's supposed to, hold on, let me do this real quick. Let me do that real quick. All right, reconnect, back into the presets, keywords. BMI 270. There we go, that's how it's supposed to work. Um, okay, so we've got, uh, who the hell is Dust King? What's the difference here? Oh, this is dual and this is single. So we're gonna click on this single. Review the list of options. Ah, very cool. Clean build without RPM filters. Clean build with RPM filters. D-Shot 300. Clean build with D, uh, RPM filters. D-Shot 600. Very cool. So we're gonna pick this one. And then we're gonna hit pick. And this preset changes PID loop rate to 3.2K. That's where it already is. Necessary for some. Please don't change it back to anything higher than 4K unless you know what you're doing. Preset also changes uh, the D low pass filter cutoff to 751 to provide the lowest latency. Interesting. Uh, all right, so we got those filter settings. We're gonna save and reboot. All right, good deal. And now it's probably gonna lock up like it usually does. Yeah. Okay, so let's exit out of that and we'll relaunch it. All right, here we go. Back into pit tuning. Let's see what that did. So, wow. Okay, yeah. I'm glad that uh, I'm glad that we did that. So it's putting a gyro low pass two at 135 hertz on a PT2 filter. Very interesting. Uh, so now we're gonna take this um, D term filter and just move it up a little bit again. And we're gonna take the gyro RPM filter. We're gonna drop it down to two harmonics. That third harmonic is a waste. Um, we're gonna take this dynamic notch filter. I'm actually gonna move it from one notch to two for a little bit of extra safety. And I'm gonna take this Q factor down from 500 to 400. Um, the, the new 4.3 filtering is pretty aggressive. And that little preset was specifically calling out um, uh, it was specifically calling out a clean build and this is a build that I want to be able to beat the shit out of like all my builds So yeah, we're gonna do that We're also gonna take this max dynamic frequency and we're gonna move this up because it's a micro with higher rpm everything um, So let's move it up to 700 that that's probably enough uh, Minimum we'll keep it 150 Move the Q down All right, so we're gonna save that and hopefully those will be good filter settings. Uh, I don't know. This is a, AIOs have a much harder time uh, than 20 by 20 stacks. So it, it might be a, a hot mess, but hopefully not. Uh, RC deadband, move that up to two. Y'all deadband, move that up to two. Stick low, a thousand. Stick high, 2000. And then we're gonna go in here. Um, uh, I'm gonna move these to auto. No, I'm not. I'm gonna leave these on manual. And set point cutoff frequency in hertz. Use with lower valve, uh, smoother inputs, more appropriate for slower. Most. Uh, I should leave this at zero. Why would? It? Most users should leave this at zero, corresponding to auto. All right, let's move it to auto. Move both of these to auto, and then the auto factor is defaulting at 130. That seems awful high, though. Uh, adjust RC smoothing. 30 is the default. Yeah, I thought 30 was the default. 130 is really high. Um, 60 for HD freestyle, 90 to 120 for cinematic flying. So this is a pretty cinematic -y number. It says note values over 50 will cause appreciable stick delay. Yeah, I usually run this at like 30. Uh, let's run it at 50 though. Cause it, so this is your, this is the best, this is arguably the best way to do stick smoothing um, is this auto factor. So I usually run this 
as aggressively as I can, but I don't want to add too much latency, so let's just do 50. We'll do 50 there. Um, Terminal Insanity says, why is it better to have 3.7 rather than 4K? Uh, it's just this gyro. Some of these, uh, some of these new 32 gauge gyros have very strange... Yeah, it's just this gyro. MPU 6000, you still can run at 4K or 8K. Um, but these BMI gyros are, are just different. Uh, okay, so let's get this thing bound. Oh God, is it gonna be? It should already be bound actually. Uh, because I wanna see what channel RSSI is on. It's usually on four, but uh, let's just check it. All right, we can also check if the video is still working. Not still working. Well, yeah, still working. Because this was a working rig. All right, so because this AIO does not put power um, on USB, I'm going to have to plug battery power in to fire up the receiver. So I might as well do it with the uh, with the Vifly hooked up and. All right, let's give it a second to buy to connect. Hopefully, uh, is it maybe a different model? Let's try this model. I bet you I deleted the model that uh, that this was bound on. God damn it! Oh, that ain't gonna do it. Um. Nah, that ain't gonna do it either. All right, I gotta get this. I gotta bind it. I deleted a whole bunch of models on my radio at one point, and there was a couple of FR Sky mod um, uh, models that I was like, mm, I don't know what rig this is for, and I was just being reckless, and I deleted them. Uh, bind mode, and uh, I might actually have to take this rig apart to get to the bind button. This is uh, I. I didn't think about this. I did not think about this. I gotta look up the RXSR and see where the hell the bind button is. RXSR. All right, so I have it mounted with the, um, I have it mount. okay, so it's right next to that plug header. I'll be able to get to it. Uh, yeah, I'll totally be able to get to it. Okay, cool, so it's right next to that plug header. Watch this. Uh, here comes the uh, the Olympics of plugging things in, friends. So I need to pull power, and ooh, this is actually kind of nice. I'll be able to just push this button to give this thing power while I'm holding the uh, the button down. But first, I need to get to the button. And now the the RXSR is shrink wrapped in there, so it's kind of hard to see it. But I th think I think I see it in there. Get my finger on the power button here, and then we're gonna get in here. And I think that's the button there. Yep, there it is. Okay, should be in bind mode. It's probably already bound. Um, it's hard to see the lights on the RXSR, but we're going to kill it, and we're going to power it back up. And let's see if we get any action on them sticks. Not yet. Well, it's, the transmitter is still in bind mode, so let's take that out. All right. And let's power cycle this all the way. So, kill the battery power, pull the USB, repower the flight controller, repower the receiver, connect, receiver tab. Do we have any action? We do not. Uh, what color is the LED on the RXSR? Man, it is hard to see. It is buried in there. It's flashing red. I don't think I got the button down. So, 
Let me hit this. Yeah, that power is all the way down. Okay. So let's try this again. Spider just ain't gonna, ain't gonna get in there. It feels like, it, it certainly felt like I was holding the button down. Man, is it hard to tell though. Uh, let's see if the loop will help. Is that the, are you the bind button there, you little bastard? Get a flashlight up in here. Let's see. Should be the bind button right there, isn't it? Sure looks like it. Yeah, that's it. That's the bind button. I must have not. Yeah, I really thought I felt it click and, and I had it down. Let's try again. Feeling for that click, man. Come on. I mean, to be honest, those are all of the, uh, those are all my top tips. From here on out, it's all just boring shit. But I was, I was hoping to test hover this all sketchy like for you guys, like I usually do around this time. But it needs to be bound in order to do that. Uh, I'm starting to think that that's not the uh, the bind button. Hold on, let me look at it from the other side. No, yeah, it's definitely where the bind button is. Um, interesting. Akash says, did you try Betaflight 4.3 or did you go back to 4.2 because of the D-Advanced problem? Uh, 4.3. Um, hmm. Man, I'm gonna be fucking pissed if I have to pull this thing apart just to get this goddamn bind button. Uh, damn it. The problem is, like, I can't. Usually you can feel it kind of click down. And I'm not feeling that. So I don't. I think I'm on it. Well, I'm going to put these where I think the button is. I'm going to pull down as hard as I can. And I'm going to push the button. What's the, uh, what's the, um, the flashing sequence of the RXSR when it's in bind mode. Anybody know offhand? It's solid red. Is that a good thing? The hell? Go into bind mode. Oh, this is. Is this D8? Is this shit in D8 mode? No, nah, it's in D16. Um, now it's flashing fast red. I think. Yeah, it looks like it's flashing fast red. Is that a good thing? I don't know. I haven't bound a, uh, I haven't bound an RXSR in a hundred days and nights. Hey, there we go. All right, cool. So, why is the preview yawing like that? What's with my yaw? It sticks off a little bit. No, sticks are fine. Why is it yawing like that? Uh, that's odd. The yaw, the yaw is centering at fourteen ninety. 
That's weird. Uh, sticks, uh, sticks bottom left, everything's below 1,000. Sticks top right, everything is above 2,000. The yaw is just barely there. Uh, so my stick low threshold and the stick th high threshold are good to go. Um, so this is off. Uh, this yaw is off enough where this yaw deadband is not working. I can always just increase the yaw deadband, which will take care of that. But the better thing to do is to um, get that shit centered. And technically I can do it with the trims. Oh, the trim was not centered. Okay. Okay, cool. The trim was not centered. I'm going to I'm going to start adding a little bit more dead band because yeah, that's interesting. Huh. Okay. Uh, Akash says, uh, your endpoints seem to be off on throttle. Shouldn't it be a thousand? Um, this is totally normal. This is always, this is what it always looks like. It, you, you always want it to go down below and above. It, uh, it tried to beep the motors and it, uh, and it tripped the vi fly. That was pretty funny. Uh, but we're good to go. <clears throat> this is actually all set. I can pull power. Uh, all right, so we're bound. Uh, we got our dead band set. We got TAER set. <clears throat> Stick. Uh, oh, 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 oh. The whole point, not the whole point, but part of the point was to figure out where the uh, RSSI is coming in. Looks like AUX4. Yeah, see AUX4 moving around? That's the RSSI there. So we're gonna go into aux4, we're gonna save it. And now we can pull power. We're gonna put power right back to it though when we get into the uh, motors tab. We're almost there, friends, almost there. Arm, horizon, aux2, I use horizon as an oh shit switch. If I lose video, I can flip this switch up, get horizon mode, um, and hopefully get out of danger. Uh, beeper, I put on aux three, switch all the way down. Uh, black box, I'm gonna put on aux two in the middle. Air mode, we're gonna put on aux two in the middle and switch all the way towards me. Uh, flip over after crash, we're gonna put on aux three in the middle. And that is about it. Sometimes I'll do launch control because it's fun. Aux 2 in the middle. Acro trainer paralyzed, VTX pit mode, we're good to go. That's how I do my switches. Motors tab, let's see who's spinning the right direction and who's spinning the wrong direction. We might actually also need to re, uh, reorder where the motors are. So let's look at reordering the motors first. Start, right rear. Oh, it looks like they were in the right positions. Left rear, left front. Cool, save it. And then come back in. And what's up, CMYK? And we're gonna set the motor direction now. We'll use the wizard. Uh, motor one is correct. Motor two is incorrect, so we're gonna click on two. Now motor two is correct, motor three is correct, motor four is incorrect, we're gonna click motor four, and we're gonna click close. And now they're all spinning in the right directions. If you wanna confirm that, just come in here, spin them up a little bit. Out, 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 and out. All set. And that, my friends, eh, not quite. I was about to say, is how we set up a quad. Uh, but it's actually not. There's a couple more things real quick. Let me fire up text edit. I have a, uh, a chunk of CLI text that sets up my OSD for me. And that is right here. Drop that on in. Save it. 
I do not need it to be powered for any of this. All right. Uh, we're gonna hide this. What the fuck is hide? Where's hide? There it is. Uh, OSD. Hey, we can go to NTSC. Uh, pitch that LQ that okay LQ is not gonna work but whatever we'll leave it in there and cool OSD is looking good video transmitter we've got smart audio 2.0 unlocked and I've got a folder with uh, the things well actually I can just click load from file and then it's gonna go right to it. So VTX table, Smart Audio 2.1, maybe that's the one. Band, race band, channel eight, power, I'm gonna leave it low for the time being. Uh, low power disarm on until first arm. Save. And hopefully that is good to go. It says device ready, yes, which is a good sign. So we're gonna save that, and then black box, the last thing here, onboard flash. Huh. I don't know these hertzes anymore. It used to be in K. That's interesting. Uh, but we definitely want gyro scaled. So we're gonna put the black box to gyro scaled. I'm gonna leave it at one quarter, save and reboot. CMYK asks, uh, do you have a tech article about what CLI texts to copy over safely? I do not, uh, but other people have info on that um, on the intranet. <laughs> All right, let's do a test hover. But in order to do that, we got to put some propellers on. And the propellers of choice of short. The propellers of choice are the Gemfan 3520s. Especially now that I have a little bit more KV, uh, these props are going to be fantastic. I mean, they're they're fantastic even on these motors at 3,000 KV. But uh, 3,500 KV is going to be fucking rocking. This thing is going to shred. So I'm probably going to have to move that uh, motor limiting down a little bit, but I'll cross that bridge when I get there. Okay, these are uh, actually titanium M2 by 7 screws. Save a little bit of weight on the rotating assembly here. See my case says props out. Yo, man, the fucking bots are, are really going for it today. Really, it's a, it's a bot fiesta up in here. But not the bot that we like. Not the bot that grinds. The bots that uh, harass and annoy. You know what I'm saying? Nerfed, says CMYK. <laughs> who's, uh, who's building in the chat? What are you building? I know a lot of people like to build while they watch me build. Uh, who learned something from uh, me going through beta flight? Anybody? Or are you guys sick of me doing that? Uh, I don't have to go through it every time, but there's a lot in there, and it took me a long time to learn it all. Uh, so I, I think there's a lot of value in me going through it once a month or so. Um, I, I try to repeat things somewhat frequently, in, in, to respect the, the folks that that are new, that find the channel, right? Like, those of you that have been around a long time, like, I feel bad because I, I feel like you guys have some of this shit, like, you're sick of hearing some of this shit. Um, but, yeah, I mean, it, it bears repeating in a lot of cases, and it sometimes will start a conversation even about, like, you know, is our understanding of this setting correct, or, I don't know. I think it's good content, but if you guys are, if, if nobody's getting anything out of it, uh, then I'll stop doing it, you know what I'm saying? 
the uh, the battery lead is coming out the wrong side. I don't like it coming out the the opposite side. It's you know no big deal. But personally, I prefer the battery lead to come out this side. But the way that the leads were cut, it it would not have. It just wasn't meant to be. So yeah, all right. We're gonna have this. So the battery is gonna sit in here like this, and then it's just gonna come around like that and plug in. And I might be able to wrap it up around the battery strap. Nah, it's not gonna. It's not gonna reach. This. Uh, I don't know about this. This might not be the best battery situation here. But let's see. Let's see where it. Where the wire sits. Oh no, that is too close. Yeah, it's way too close. That can very easily drop down and get in there. Uh, so let's troubleshoot this. If that's there, damn it. Um, what if? Telemetry lost. I don't like to do this, but. Justin Kim says it's incredibly useful. Awesome. Uh, what if I get it up here? Yeah, this is going to give me a little bit more clearance. And maybe I can even tuck this. I really like to... Um, one, of the, one of the local guys actually just lost a rig um, yesterday. Um, probably in plain sight uh, because the battery unplugged. Um, preventing your battery from unplugging is a really big deal. Like you will absolutely lose a rig at some point um, if you do not pay attention and uh, secure your, or just think about uh, how your battery is is in here and, and just give some thought to, uh, you know, what if it comes unplugged. That's fine. I'm okay with that amount of clearance between the prop and the... Uh, and this balance lead protector, it not to mention that even, shut up! Not to mention that um, even if the prop does bend up, it's not gonna hit this. So, let's do something sketchy. Uh, if you're going to be dumb and test hover inside, there are a couple of things you can do to make it a little bit less dumb, slash sketchy. Um, Thing. There it goes. Uh, so you get it over there and you just really quickly arm and then disarm and just see what happens. Now a little bit longer. Now a little bit longer. Cool. Nice and smooth, nice and soft, no weird grinding, no weird oscillations, nice and chill. Now we're going to arm it and we're going to move the right stick only. And there is a chance that it could flip out here, so pay attention and be ready to disarm. So you're gonna arm it and just bump the right stick and then disarm right away. Just to be sure it doesn't go bananas. That was totally fine. Now we're gonna go in all directions. And what you're making sure of is that it's doing what you're telling it to do. If you push it to the right and it goes to the left, stop, there's a problem. It's gonna try to eat you. Um, now we can actually increase the throttle, which is going to make the PID loop become active. So now it could also freak out. So again, careful. Be ready to disarm it. Arm it. Slowly raise the throttle. Yay, there you go. Something's going on. Uh, so it went... So it could be yaw. Uh, so this is... I forgot to click uh, motors are reversed in the motors tab, I'll bet you. So we're gonna plug in. And I think I saw somebody call that out in chat actually. And I missed it. Uh, all right, yep, there it is. Motor direction is reversed. So I need to flick that switch on. And now it will uh, have a better chance of actually flying. Let's try it again. Uh, I've built a million rigs. And I still get it wrong sometimes. Always assume that you're going to get it wrong and do this the right way rather than the chop your fucking head off way. And as you guys could see, it still 
uh, it still moved around properly, right? So like, if you weren't doing this step by step, you could have just been like, oh yeah, it's fine. Let's let's hammer the throttle, and it would have went up into the ceiling fan in anger. So we're still dealing with a loaded gun. Arm it. Slowly raise the throttle. Be ready to disarm. But in this case, we're good. So by moving the throttle around like that, what I'm doing is I'm putting it into different RPMs. You want to check your motor heat as quick as you can. Um, I'm putting it into di different RPMs and just listening, listening for any weirdness at, uh, at different RPM values. Uh, but in this case, we seem to be fine. It's, it sounds really, really smooth and everything is reacting the way that it should be. And there's no like weird grindiness or grumbliness or anything really. Um, so it's still daylight. I'm going to go put this, uh, well, let's see if the, uh, let's see if the video is, is working. Uh, I am going to put a memory card in this and go fling it up in the air outside for you guys. And then I can pull the, uh, I can pull the card and we can watch the maiden real quick. Uh, let me find something for you guys to watch. I'll give you guys a little bit more footage from this in its previous configuration while we're waiting, but first let me check the video system to see if it's working. Oops. Come on. Get in there. Come on. Come on. Get! Get in there! There we go. Uh, do we have video? Not without turning the goggles on, that's for fucking sure. Oh, we have video, but good lord is it noisy. What is happening here? What is going on? Am I on the wrong chat? Oh, no. The battery just went dead. Helps to have a functioning goggle battery, I guess. Even though that one still says 60%. Uh, where's the fat shark battery? Here it is. All right, friends. Let's see if we have video. I'm gonna do a little test flight. Do we have? No, it's still very noisy. What the fuck is going on? Um. Oh, it's in pit mode. Oh, okay, okay. So this is that weird locked pit mode shit. That uh, that the tiny tank deals with. So we go into we go into the OSD. We point our patch directly at it. Uh, we go to features. We go down to VTX. We go down to config, and then the OP model is set to race right now. We're going to move it to free. It's going to reset it, and now we've got regular power and everything. Why is everything so fucking pink though? Is it pink in here? Oh, I guess it's pink in here. <laughs> uh, I'm going to move the power up to 400. I'm going to hit save. It's still sitting at 25, though, because it's because uh, it hasn't been armed yet. And, yeah, we're good to go. Let me go put this up in the air, see how it is. Throw a memory card in it, and then um, we'll wrap this stream on up. Back. Save and exit. So it's giving me a link quality warning. Oh, because because I have the LQ warning, right? It doesn't use LQ. I'm actually gonna fix that. So here's the ESC beeper. It's been plugged in for two minutes and it hasn't, the ESC hasn't gotten any commands. So it's beeping and saying, hey, I'm getting hot, come back. Uh, I'm gonna get LQ out of the OSD because LQ is going to take over the warnings and it's going to flash the LQ warning constantly and I won't be able to get any other warnings. So really quick fix here, come into OSD, turn off link quality, and then in the warnings, turn off the link quality warning as well here. 
and then save. Uh, and I mean, I might as well center the uh, the RSSI while I'm at it. Is that centered? Maybe. Save. All right, here's a little bit of frying uh, while I go out and fry. <laughs> you donkeys. Uh, okay. I'll be right back. I want to give you guys audio. To each his or her own. Later. Uh, this is the uh, Gem Fan 4023s. Why do I crash so often? It makes that footage... I didn't crash just now, though, but... <laughs> makes that footage that I try to show you guys only good for a couple of minutes. Uh, flying good. Let me show you guys. So this is a... This is a, a pretty uh, standard maiden for me. Uh, you want to do all the prop wash moves. You want to kind of ease into it a little bit. Uh, but then you do want to hammer on it a little bit. This battery was... Uh, uh, not loving life because it's been plugged in a bunch, but 
uh, had just 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 enough in the battery to uh, to move it around. I'm actually going to move the uh, the throttle limiting up. These props are a very low pitch, so they really like RPM. Uh, that 95% throttle scale is a little low, uh, so we can move that up a little bit. But here's what a typical. Um, uh, maiden looks like for me, in case you were wondering. Let's see if it'll play. On ye oldie computer. And this is also what the HD looks like from the uh, Runcam Hybrid. Although half this stream has been the HD from the Runcam Hybrid. Let's see if it'll play smoothly. Also, the, uh, the VTX went back into the pit mode thing, which was a little weird. It didn't save it. Kind of annoying. It looks way more uh, prop washy in here. Uh, it's just because the computer's struggling to me to keep up with the frame rate. Zero bounce back on uh, roll or pitch, and even the yaw is nice and crisp. Uh, going for the big dive as soon as possible. You know me. Yeah, you can't, the, the computer can't keep up with the frame rate, so this is kind of worthless, but, um, yeah, flies really good. It's, uh, it's back, and I, re I instantly remember how good this thing flies. <laughs> Uh, so, yeah. I'm gonna go fly with the guys, I think. And I should have a couple batteries still charged for this. <clears throat> and I'll get some actual footage, and I'll put it up on Patreon, which costs you three whole dollars a month, ten cents a day, to, uh... Ah. To, uh, to join, and then you'll get access to all the behind-the-scenes shit, and you'll help a gangly motherfucker chase his dream of not working in corporate America again and uh, making cool content for you guys to watch. Thanks for hanging out, friends. This has been the uh, rebuild, the rebirth of the 250 and uh, it certainly looks like this Akon AIO is pretty goddamn good. That was very clean and Motors aren't hot. It's It's been a while, so the motors probably cooled down if they were hot, but uh, it's looking like the Akon AIO is the one to have. Uh, there it is again. Naked HD fun. If you guys need a good time, hide user on this channel. Terminal Insanity with the last comment of the live stream. It says, if you can find a way to switch to your goggle feed during li live stream, that would be next level. Um, yeah, that'll be happening at uh, the house, but here on the old computer, it can't handle it. Uh, but yeah, that'll be the setup at the house. Lots of cool shit coming. Love you guys. I'll see you tomorrow at 10 o'clock. Uh, I don't think tomorrow is a giveaway stream, but it's a good time Charlie stream. Love you. Goodbye. Here comes the flying. No, you already got the flying. Well, here's some more flying. Uh, double awning. What is this? Oh, right. Fins edit. Okay. And then there's stables. Ooh, that edit's done as well. Uh, here's some stadium footage. I think this is the first time I flew there. Be good. See you guys tomorrow night. Bye bye.
Woo-hoo! <laughs>